Hello family, we hope that you're enjoying yourselves here with us on the Lit Television Network. We're interrupting the current programming in order to begin our following scheduled broadcast. Enjoy! Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I am Kim Warner, I'm your host today, and I have John from Pragmatic Solutions. He is my co-host. I have grabbed him over here. Let him shine with me. So we're starting off today, this week, with a question that John asked me from the last recording. And he was discussing with me, he wanted to talk about transference of spirit. When I look back at the recording, what I found is a lot of information. So we're going to take information from that first recording piece by piece and begin to edify you all, ourselves, and anyone else, you know, moving on. So last week, John, you asked about discussing transference of spirits. Mm -hmm. And one of the topics that weighed heavy was immorality. Um, why immorality weighs heavy for me is, and that's going to be different for everyone. I understand that it's going to be my opinion, so I leave that with you, but thought-provoking. Immorality has become a collective issue because somewhere down in the decades, prayer was taken out of school, um, the moral ethics of prayer or even going to church. Now we know that some people feel certain kind of ways about church now, but we also discussed in that first segment that church is within you. It's what Jesus said, the temple is who he served, his own temple, not a church. Jesus never had a church. So these are facts that you can't take away. So once you find yourself uh, looking for truth, you're resolved to really look at what Jesus was doing. Now, transference of spirit can be a good thing or it can be bad. And we want to talk about the immoral uh, transference. So I want to let you know that it's on the table because my driver today, John, mm -hmm. said he was working somewhere and the people didn't want to keep the place clean. He brought up ethics. We talked about ethics last week. Ethics is in morality. That means that there's a structure. There's a way that we do things in order for us to what? Progress in life and profit out of life. And I don't mean just profit financially. I mean, you can profit in your network, in your teamwork, as in this young man brought up. They had no ethics because the food that people was eating was not properly sanitized, right? Mm. Sorry. Mm. So, you understand ethics. So, he's telling me the story that we're talking about. Um, immorality is not just about you know, the sexual liaisons that we have, because I want to go there. Everybody thinks that sexual liaisons outside of your marriage is a issue. It is an issue, but we have other areas to cover when it comes to immorality. And when immorality is practiced, there's no morals in the person, or they're not practicing the morals that they could have. So the church back centuries ago, let's say in the times of the Roman age, mm -hmm. They brought up doctrines. This is the time when Pontus and all of them were in there and Jesus was being um, crucified because his teaching was different. He was teaching the spirit, whereas they were teaching um, uh, more on the physical plane. He was teaching spiritual worship, right? So the transference of spirit through the uh, religious doctrines and the reason for the church is that we have a foundation that we can come to that brings us into correction and accountability. An immoral spirit is not going to want to be corrected or put on the right course because it's used to the way that it's been doing things. Mm -hmm. That brings us back to where church, um, not church, but you know, prayer was taken out of church. I mean, out of Schools. uh, schools. Mm -hmm. Schools needed it because there's a lot of kids that were not getting this information that we're talking about today. The schools have changed as well, I want to say that, but there is a challenge to bring it all back. 
You bring it back in your own home, in your own communities. You begin to work with those that are uh, in the children more than anything because each generation that we're able to assist in bringing back, then this is what's pleasing to ourselves, our communities, but God first. I want to add something else. In this book that we study as Christians, it's all about families. What book? The Bible. Okay. Now, if you have other religions, you're still held accountable because family is the core issue. Family is the core of God's divine plan. In the beginning, God created a man and a woman, to, not just to procreate now, but he did it so that a family would be whole. The man wanted wholeness, right? He was lonely. So we go from there, and now I'll turn it back to you. You know, one of the things that when I hear you talk about uh, uh, prayer in school, the thing I always tell people when they talk about prayer in school, I said, they had prayer in school uh, when they gave us them regular books that they didn't want anymore. Mm -hmm. But prayer was in school. Yes. Uh, you know, we need prayer, just like you said, in the homes. Yes. Uh, but a lot of homes don't have that, so uh, to have prayer in school, was for the kids that didn't have prayer at the house. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I hear you talk about all that you talk about, you know, I'm intrigued by your, your thought process on covenant. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain a little bit about covenant and how it relates to the family uh, and the Bible and the importance of, of the word covenant? Covenant is a um, commitment. So first, your, this is your commitment. We're, we have Deuteronomy 5 sitting here on the table. Um, and you could put it on your table as well. Uh, it would be the beginning of restoration for you and your children or even a community. Because Deuteronomy is the commitment that Moses made with God up on the mount. And the okay. reason why, um, and we're looking at this from his point of view, but we bring it into the context of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. So we bring him back alive. So Moses has went up on a mountain and God has given him information for the people. Why? Because he wants the stiff-necked people. Let's say it a little bit further along. But he wants the stiff-necked people to get unstiff. Mm -hmm. Stiffness is, and that neck is about pride. You know, you're puffed up. Mm -hmm. But moving on from there, the commitment that you have, your covenant can't be strong with another person or where you work. It cannot be strong if it don't start at home. That home that I'm speaking of is in the heart. So when you start at home and you go back, go back to God or turn your face like uh, Hezekiah did back to the wall and he began to pray to God, this is where the covenant and the commitment with life begins. So a lot of times we think that our commitment is you know, through marriage, but we're committed to life. We're committed to God first. And so Moses exemplifies that. I know that we see it differently, but the way that I saw it was definitely in him being sacrificed to lead in something that he had no idea of. You know, he walked into a situation and then he had to go and deal with people. He thought on his own and, no, you just take yourself and say, um, I am sent me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he meets God on the mountain and he brings in the Ten Commandments. And the covenant is your commitment to God. You see, even when we bring in the context of someone gossiping or talking about someone else, what they don't see is their covenant. They're breaking a covenant with God because you're speaking against God. On a deeper level, this is God and me. God and me and you are talking. Mm -hmm. Our gods are speaking mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So if you know, I explained this to one of my, uh, the people in one of my classes. God is different for everyone. What we don't understand is that we can serve a God of darkness, a God of lust, a God of hate, a God that hates covenant, hates commitment. This God is who we infiltrate in our lives every day. A God of lack, a God of confusion. But how you turn that around is through that, I just said on the table, 
Deuteronomy 5, you become committed to turning your life around. This is the first covenant. It's not about your mate. It's not about the people that you work with. It's seeing that there's something greater in you or that you want to strive towards greatness. Yes? Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. commitment to you begins to change your whole environment. But it's changing you inside first because commitment is in the heart. So start with you first. That's right. It's the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ain't no worship without heart. Sometimes you can't even break into worship because things have been so hard in your life that you just want to sit in the hardness. You break through worship with worship, the hardness, it disappears. The hurt and the pain, it disappears. You find that to be a way, and that's changing you. Mm -hmm. That's a key point. It's changing you because worship has come and shown you, oh, Praise him. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That worship changes you. It changes your heart. It changes the environment. You see the change even when others will say, I don't see it. Mm -hmm. They can't see it in most cases because they haven't become it. They're still living in their own reality. So this worship shows you how to be committed to God. Along with the words. The words. I and my father are one. The word. I and my father are one is a commitment. It's not just something that you say. When I go and I stand in the word or I digest the word. What happens is it becomes one with me. There's no changing it. Right? So again, we're back at transformation. Mm -hmm. So what am I transforming? I don't want immorality anymore. I feel that because immorality may have put me in incarceration, in jail. What's going to solve the problem? See, we're looking at problem solving, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is one thing, but solving the problem is the other. So in between, we have this gap. I need to get to the solution. I don't believe that there's other, any other solution. No matter what I study, my foundation always brings me back to the Christ. The Word is my solution. Because no matter what I study, I've had people to look at my post. And, you know, I study a lot of things because I, I believe that if you don't study, the enemy can get you caught off guard. There's so many things out there, such as covenant. You went to the to the to the uh, went before uh, the preacher and you got married, but you didn't understand what covenant was because there's so many people that don't understand commitment. But back to the point, I commit myself unto Thee, under the mighty hand of God. It ain't religion; it's a way of life. The other thing about it, the way of life makes you happy. Ain't nobody else's responsibility to make you happy. Mm -hmm. The joy of the Lord is in you because you have begun to work with the fruit of the Spirit. You understand that in order to be a better person, you got to bind up stuff in you. Mm -hmm. And stop fighting other people uh, as if they're praying against you. Christians praying against each other. I say P-R-E-Y. Not P-R-A-Y. You ain't -E -Y, praying. Huh? Mm -hmm. Praying. You pray for yourself. That's a responsibility which and your accountability to your own life, which brings us back to, again, Deuteronomy. There's so much teaching right here. Mm -hmm. Because all of this that he brought down from the mountain was about the heart and even the acknowledgement that when you begin to praise, excuse me, when you begin to worship and when you put the effort into changing you, you, no one else can do it for you. What happens is, is you, be, you begin to see that truth that's in this word. No more am I fornicating. Why? Because I don't want to do it. Either you allow it to trap you and keep you forever. You in that pit you can never get out of, which is tormenting. That's the devil. Who is this devil? Who made these choices? Mm. The devil made me do it. No, I did. Now, accountability to my choices. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, should I stop now? Uh, one of the other things I like is uh, uh, verses 7. It talks about no other, uh, thou should not have... No, no other, other God, God before, before me. me. You know, a lot of people put a whole lot of stuff before uh, the God in them and the God uh, uh, that they wish it. Uh, talk, talk to 
because what I'm what I'm finding out as I live the longer I live is that a lot of people put a whole lot of other gods yeah. before them mm -hmm. and before the god that they worship. So talk about that transformation in terms of being available to move those other gods that they've placed uh, in front of them yeah. so their so, life can be better. So the God, I am the Lord, we're on seven, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So we look at the choice of buying a car that we cannot afford. Mm. We look at the choice of buying a home that we cannot afford. That brings us into an understanding after the pain. That's right. There's going to be some pain if you do those kind of things. Yeah. After the pain, to teach us that we should have counted up the cost. Mm. <laughs> mm. Now, we don't all have that savvy. I know I didn't, but I learned through the pain. Mm. And the pain was realizing that I was serving a God of ambition a God of uh, material. This world is about material things, mm -hmm. but the spirit is not. The spirit realm is a place where you go and again you worship to um, manifest, learn manifestation, the power of manifestation. So even as we talk about worship, what, what I would like to tell everyone is, is that it's not just hallelujah. We glorify you. Over in Jeremiah, Jeremiah was schooled by God. God was telling him in the first chapter, tell me what you see. That means that Jeremiah was being taught to use his vision mm -hmm. within, his third eye. And when we begin to praise and worship, we see those things as though they are not as what we see in the earthly realm this gives us the empowerment that God had had like in the first chapter of Genesis because God had to speak everything into existence mm -hmm. we see ourselves as sons and daughters when we take that note so if I move or I begin to work on some of the conditioning that we've had believing that things, people, places make me who I am, that's when I'm able to break uh, the power of possessions or these gods that are um, seemingly um, about possessions, the god of material. Hmm. Um, well, tell, tell me this, uh, is that third eye for real? Yeah. Talk yeah. to me about that third eye. So the third eye is the place where after you're cleared, I, I think that you acquire the ability to manifest when you come into the earth, right? But because there's no guidance on manifestations and where it happens or how it happens, a lot of us have been, we've fallen short of that. So... When you close your eyes and you begin to envision yourself at a place that you want to travel, mm -hmm. you can be there. So that's the third hour. Yes. You can be there because you're seeing it. That's the kingdom. The kingdom of God is within. The kingdom means that you are creating a world of your own. It's not a creation of world outside of you, which is another God. This is the world of God. I mean, of the of darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, the earth is has had been given to um, the darkness or the the devil. I don't really believe in saying devil because I just don't believe that it has power over us. Of course, I had to come to that place. But even when you write devil down, you'll see that it's lived. So I have a hard time seeing devil anymore. Do you do you understand what I'm saying? Because devil is simply living your past. It's living past thinking. So if if someone used the third eye, which is right here. Oh, so it's not because you always see, especially in Egyptian, uh, um, you know, things. It's right here in the, in the in the middle of your head. So it's not in the middle of your head. It is, but it's inside of the middle. So it's going to, um, the penile gland is where it's sitting, actually. So the third eye, when you 
meditate, it begins to. I was just thinking that that's that's yeah. when you really connect with that third eye, right? Mm -hmm. Through meditation. Yeah, yeah. So once you start connecting with meditation, you find that it's in here, but it can begin to see throughout um, the one-sided vision. Mm -hmm. um, some people will say foresighted or foresight, um, but the foresight is so. When you're meditating, and people can meditate and walk around, they begin to see, pick up on things as they're throughout their day. Meditation brings you into consciousness. Consciousness is what really um, gets you to a place where you're not the same person and you're obeying the Ten Commandments, right? Because your choices will be different because your consciousness is raising. We've been subconsciously trained to think a certain way. Um, that is um, untraining, which is what we're talking about here too, because living immorally means that I'm untraining myself from a way. To get into morality means that I'm retraining, which you know, when you go back to the scripture, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That means that I identify with the God that's truly before me. I identify that I have been a person that worshiped material things rather than the God of, the, of spirit and truth. You see? And so from there, my trajectory changes. Because I've learned something more than what I knew before. You know, I, I, I hope I'm clear. I actually wrote Devil Down... And then I, I and and it is lived. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's 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 amazing. That's mm -hmm. illuminating. Uh, talk to me about this. I, I've always had, and I've, I've always wanted to talk to somebody like you that that can go deeper. Why is it that in our community we uh, we sh we don't like cremations? We like to uh, waste five thousand dollars on laying somebody out in the in the uh, in the church and. And and you know and these funerals that I go to, or well, not I go to, because you know the funerals that I see where people talk, be laying on the casket and crying, talking about they want to get over in there. I always want want to know why don't they rise up? And I bet they won't want to get in there anymore. But the bottom line is that why is it that we don't do cremations? What what's, what's you know we go back to the dust anyway. Why not just accelerate it and get back there quicker and not spend. Five thousand dollars. You know what I'm talking it's about. It's still in the same perspective that the body of an individual has become a god, rather than us understanding discipleship wow. brings you into detachment. Okay. So, okay. you know, emotionally, we don't know how to detach. Um, it is painful because we're living in two different worlds. We're living in a world that says, um, "I'm spirit and truth." You know, I'm born of spirit, but the other part is. The reality of death on this side of heaven in the earth mm -hmm. is not something that most people face. And you have to face things within yourself. The other thing is that I found I was afraid of death. But when I became saved and Holy Ghost filled, it doesn't matter. It stopped. Mm -hmm. All right, on cremation, they believe, some people believe that you're burning up the individual. They don't understand that the spirit has went oh. back yeah, oh. to once it, it came mm -hmm. from. And because of that conflict, and maybe not, no teaching in it, um, they people feel, some people feel like, well, you know, I think it's wrong to burn the body. And that's uh, an attachment. It's um, uh, information that has not been shared where people understand it. But more people are doing cremations now because... Um, Burying was more expensive. Now create cremations are becoming more expensive because it's a commodity. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered you. Uh, the soul. You, you, you did good. You did good. The other thing in, in, in uh, verse 22, it talks about thick darkness. You know, when I look at thick darkness, uh, it, what's the, it's darkness is darkness. What, what, what are they really trying to say? What, what do you think they're really trying to say when they say in that second uh, uh, sentence? At the end of the second sentence, thick darkness. You know, I, I thought darkness was darkness. Mm 
there's another level of darkness? I believe that it is. So here is 22. It says, These words the Lord spoke unto all your assembly in the mount of the midst of the fire of, of, of the cloud and the thick darkness. So even as a cloud can be thick in your mind, the darkness can be um, verbated as more dark than it had been before. Um, it looks like a mind of confusion. Mm. But mm -hmm. even the pit of hell. So I believe that there's levels of darkness that we can go through, um, but we can always come back to that, that light. Now, in you asking that, I believe that the darkness is only there and that cloud being um, more profound because there's times when God doesn't want us to know from someone else and we have to walk through that profound darkness to get to that place where God is speaking to us. You, you see, because people mm -hmm. rely on others, so your darkness is profound. Mm -hmm. If you are relying on others, he said, you shall have no other God before me. Mm -hmm. So even over each, each of us, God will become jealous. So you can have a profound darkness because you don't see me. I'm the one. I'm mm -hmm. your way maker. I'm mm -hmm. your help. I'm your keeper. Mm -hmm. You know? I'm the one that puts bread and uh, butter in your refrigerator. I put the gas in your car. Mm -hmm. It's not those people that mm -hmm. you keep talking about. You know, I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. But, you know, he says over in Deuteronomy, yeah, I give you the power to obtain wealth. But we forget about this. It is God. Okay. All right, we got uh, less than two minutes left. Uh, is there one thing or a couple of things that you want to talk about? I, I really like when you delve into the spirit realm uh, because I don't think we spend a, 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 as much time as I think we should understanding the spiritual part of our existence, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the spiritual part is more important. Um, there's a rebirth. Mm. When you come here, I think that you have to work out your soul salvation, but you have to know what you're working on, which is what you've been born into. Um, when you work out your soul salvation, after that you find that there was um, a breach. We're a breach because we go back to spirit, the spiritual concepts, yes? Mm. And as we take on the spiritual concepts, we begin to learn that there is a different way than what we've seen as we were growing up. Families and friends, it's different in Jesus, yeah. If, if someone wanted to have a session with you, I know you got what? Tuesdays and Thursdays, mm -hmm. uh, let them know how to, how to contact you. They can actually go to www.kimwarnersworld.com no, or call me at 702-980-8752 if you're serious. And we'll set up appointments. Yeah. I like it, I like it when you say if you're serious. Yeah. This is right. serious. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. And, and, and uh, the, the interesting thing is that you have been in tune with and watching Kim's Universe. Kim's Universe on the Lit TV Network. Thank you for watching. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. My name is Kim Warner, and I just want to invite you guys to go on my Facebook page and look at the fundraiser that we're doing. We're raising money to assist families and children that are in need. We have Christmas coming up, and we would love for you to be a part of it. We appreciate you, we love you, and we bless you.